we didn't just want to win. We wanted to dominate. In the first half, we weren't dominant. In the second half, we got it together, and uh, we began to dominate. But we wanted to really impose our will because the whole theme of the week was it's personal. Um, <laughs> one of the funniest moments in the darn game at the Shador took his helmet off after he made the tremendous scramble. It was like a Heisman type play. And I went over and said, you cannot do that. You cannot take your helmet off. He said, dad, it's personal. And I just laughed, I just bent over and laughed my butt off because it was in the moment and I was really upset. And he broke, he, he broke the monotony up with it's personal. So they really took it to heart, that whole theme of the week. Welcome into a new Buff Stampede Radio. Adam Mostert Tiger, the publisher of BuffStampede.com. Joined once again by football analyst William Gardner. He was the uh, original believer on this podcast, and I jumped on board, William. I, I had the Buffs winning against Nebraska by 14 points, and uh, they ev even did better than that. That that was a lot of fun on Saturday. Yeah, I was, well, I was. It, it was stressful through that first half. I don't know. There was just you know, there's 10, 15 years of, of CU trauma. I, I don't know. It's going to take a few. I, I might take a couple seasons or maybe maybe just a few more wins. I don't know. But uh, watching that first quarter, I still sort of had that churning guts of the last few years. Like, oh, man, the wheels are going to come off. I knew it was just a dream. But, uh, you know, you just got to hang in there. And, and the, the difference... The difference in this one, though, is that I really trusted these coaches to make adjustments and to do things differently. And we saw that, I think, extensively in this game, that that, that it, two weeks in a row, we've outcoached the other team significantly, significantly outcoached the other team. In, in a, and I don't mean just X's and O's, but a wide variety of different ways of doing that. We're going to get into that and kind of go through and share our notes from the game on Saturday. Uh, first off, though, I got to say that I was really surprised that the low percentage of Nebraska fans that were in Folsom Field, I, I think on TV, it made it look like there were a lot more, there was a lot more red in the stadium than there really was. Obviously, they had a couple sections, but uh, the rest of it was pretty spattered throughout and, and was a much different looking Folsom Field than back in 2019, the last time they hosted Nebraska. It, it's kind of hard to believe it's been that long, four years since this, since I, I really swear to God, I would have thought that game was more recent, but um, <clears throat> you know, it, it is interesting. I'm really kind of shocked by it because to, to look at the TV replay, you know, cause I recorded it, that stadium looks red, man, uh, in the TV. Um, so it's just sort of surprising to me what a difference the, the actual site versus the, the TV is, but with regards to them having less fans, you know, they're a dreadful program. Man. I mean, they're just not good. And, uh, you know, I think they're kind of in the same spot we were. And, and I don't think that rule brings the kind of excitement. You know, I saw some idiot uh, talking after the game about, well, you know, in four years, you'll be sorry and we'll be happy. Okay. Well, whatever, man, just off you go now. Um, but uh, I think after you've been losing year after year, some of the shine wears off and, you know, now I, uh, now it's three times in a row they've lost to us. And I don't know. I don't know if they'll ever stop showing up where their team goes, but I got to figure it's, it's they're, they're, they they just don't have the excitement. I, th I think uh, if they'd have beat Minnesota, I think they'd have been here. So I got to ask you, based on your history, the fact that uh, you saw this rivalry go from one where Nebraska really didn't accept Colorado as a true rival to the fact that, you know, 62 36 happens. And then now since 2010, Colorado's three and zero against Nebraska. Uh, how does that make you feel? And have you taken more satisfaction in a Colorado win th than you did on Saturday in a really long time? Cause uh, oh. I think it'd be hard to find another example of a game that would make you feel better as a Buffs fan. Yeah, and it was complete domination. You know, my first year up there at CU was 83, and I think that was Coach Mack's second year. And, you know, they openly laughed at him when he said, I'm going to make Nebraska our rival. And, and you know, we had a big board. You know, we had to, we were in the old team house that was there before even the – the um, and what's the one the one that's there now at the end of the end zone. And it was just a squatty little one-story built. Well, I guess, I guess it was a two-story, but it was built into a hill, so the top was only one story. But um, – 
and on the stairs going down was a big schedule, right? And and everybody else was in black and Nebraska was in red letters and Mac really took it seriously. And, and um, you know, people laughed at him and it was a joke. And it really was like those first two years, it was brutal, you know, first uh, three or four years. Um, and then uh, it started getting, you know, it was like, I mean, it would be like, maybe we'd stay close until halftime and then it'd end up being 50 to 14 or something like that. And then it got close, you know, there was a couple of years where it was like, I think, you know, we got real close. It was seven, nothing, I think in 88 um, on the road. And then we finally beat them in whatever season that was 2010. And it, it, it was just magical. And then after that, it was fairly even, even rivalry. Um, and then, you know, they cost us the national championship in night. Well, okay. They, they cost us a, 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 un, un, they, they cost us a, um, undisputed national championship because that POS coach of theirs voted for Georgia tech and, and then in 90, and then they cost us on the field in 94. So it was heated and they got into the nineties and they were, you know, towards the end of the nineties, they were one of the best teams around. And now we're both kind of like, uh, we're refining our, our glory, I think. And, um, so the, the shine's kind of worn off the rivalry, but it, but it was amazing how it was picked up by all the media, local and national, um, and, and by coach prime and his, his staff and his players. And, and it really felt like, you know, the old days back in, in the late nineties and or in through the nineties when it was, uh, so heated and, and, uh, so much bitterness and anger and hate and, and just, just to, um, I don't know, I'm probably going to go to a bad place for saying this, but just watching them all leave with sad faces just made my little heart feel good. <laughs> well, I'm sure the folks that tuned in to us over the summer know that when I get you going on Nebraska, it's always good stuff. Uh, I mean this in the nicest way possible. When it comes to N Nebraska and this rivalry, you're kind of like a wind up doll. You just you wind yeah. you up and let you go. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, I, I wonder if this game – sort of take some of the edge off now, you know, I don't, cause now it's like, uh, you know, I don't feel sorry for him, but um, uh, it's like, eh, you guys aren't that good. So, you know, well, going back to the big 12, there's really no natural rival for Colorado still. Right. I mean, I've heard some people suggest maybe that will develop into Oklahoma state because there is a pretty long history with them. And right. the fact that right. uh, Oklahoma is now leaving the big 12. So Oklahoma state's kind of looking for somewhat of a rival as well, I would think. Uh, so maybe that's possible, but gosh, if you can get this scheduled, I think every four years, if you can do a home and home twice in that stretch, I think that that's perfect for this rivalry going forward. I don't know if you need Nebraska every year non-conference, uh -huh. and I don't think they'd want to either. Um, but I, I do hope that after next year, the game in Lincoln, that there are more games on the horizon between these two programs. Yeah, I think they need to match up every few years and see how it's going. But I mean, they need to get they need to get their their program fixed and back on the map you know that they, they the last thing they need is another off you know out of conference game against us where we're beating them all the time so you know they got to get back to the uh the way uh tom osborne built that program by beating cupcakes well i enjoy the fact that as much as coach prime has changed around the cu program because it needed to be changed and shaken up as we've seen uh that's breed bred really good results uh but he's stuck with the tradition and he's not going to turn his back on, you know, a Nebraska rivalry, even though it's not something that uh, he's had to like, you know, experience throughout his life, but quickly embraced it. And then uh, it was really nice of Shador Sanders to, you know, let those guys know what time it was with his Rolex at midfield. Right. That was, yeah. that was. a. a <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if that was Nebraska or just that they were disrespecting the, the buff on the middle of the field or our field or whatever, but I, I Shadur just, said I, it was because he felt they were disrespecting their logo and he was yeah. not about that. And so uh, I enjoyed so, that. I think, I think that that's the type of pregame stuff that like is fine. It's fun. It's for right. college football, for rivalries. There right. was no punches thrown. There was no real pushing. It was just kind of a, a rivalry moment. And, and yeah. some people are maybe making too much out of it. I actually, I, I thought it was awesome. Well, that I thought it was awesome too, but I, I guess what I'm just saying is, w w would it have been the same if it was, uh, I don't know, Oregon State or Washington State or somebody we didn't really care about so much? But uh, I don't know because fun. Matt Rule did kind of fuel this thing a little bit. I think there was a little extra because of some of the comments he made. Right, right. 
well, absolutely. Going back all the way, you know, back before the summer and everything else, and the way the way that all played out, he, you know, and he he and and I I I, I appreciated Shadur's comments in his post game, where he talked, where he brought that up and specifically said, you know, you talked a lot of stuff about my dad, you know, and, and you tried to, and and I think he's right. He could have taken it a step further and said, you know, and you tried to be coy about it, to try to be, you know, try to mask them not quite so that they weren't direct comments you know uh, so that you could pretend that you didn't say anything negative and now you want to be friends and so you know now now i'm going to tell you i don't want to be your friend and take take your red clad locusts and go home today's episode is brought to us by macaulay capital fractional cfo services is your business looking for financial guidance and support but not yet big enough to hire a full-time cfo Well, we have a solution for you. Hiring a fractional CFO who can work with your business on a part-time basis. You get the benefit of having a seasoned financial expert on your team without the commitment or expense of a full-time hire. And here's the best part. It's likely that a partnership with Macaulay Capital will be a win-win situation, meaning that your business will make more money from the guidance of a fractional CFO than the total cost of partnering with us. For more information or to set up a meeting, please visit MacaulayCapital.com. That's M-C-C-A-U-L-E-Y Capital.com. BuffStampede.com has collaborated with longtime subscriber Aaron Lott in his tailgate prior to home games at Folsom Field this fall. The Buff Stampede tailgate is in Lot 308 with tailgating going on from 2 to 7 prior to this upcoming Saturday's Rocky Mountain Showdown. Aaron does ask that you RSVP for the tailgate by Friday morning so that he's got a good idea of how much food to have available and ask folks to chip in $10 as well. Look for the thread pinned at the top of the Inside the Herd message board on buffstampede.com for the RSVP link as well as more information on the tailgate. I plan to stop by before heading into the stadium on Saturday. Hope to see you there. Let's jump into the game. Uh, first off, the first thing you, uh, you notice is Juwan Mitchell is out there starting at linebacker, and he flashed early in the game. It looked like he might have had a blown assignment on that long Jeff Sims touchdown run. Uh, but Vonta Bentley still got out there quite a bit in this game, graded yeah. out better by pro football focus and had that nice pressure late in the fourth quarter. So he looked a little bit better than he did in the opener. So uh, you've got more depth there at linebacker than than you had a couple weeks ago. Yeah, and I think that'll keep work. That'll keep developing, and they've you know they got some young guys that they can keep working on in there. And then you get Gant back, I think probably this week, and then you add add him to the mix, and and everybody plays a little more. Ham gets a little more used to playing, um, and so I think we're we're you know uh, who who was it? One of those guys, I think it might have been Xavier Weaver said said, "Hey, uh, all the Louis ain't even hit the field yet." So you know we still got some guys that are coming in. It's nice to. Uh, uh, you know, we got guys at various positions where we need them coming in that are going to really boost this team as we go along, you know, so and I think that's that's important. So the other thing it was a very different offense we played against um, this week uh, for Nebraska as opposed to what we had in TCU. So probably this this offense plays more to uh, uh, Vontae Bentley's strengths, I would say. Yeah. Who would you start if you were uh... – Andre Hart at that position? Uh, you know what? It really depends on the game plan and what the offense is that you're looking at. I think I think this particular week you probably go uh, with, 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 with Bentley because this figures – well, I don't know what CSU does. And I don't really care. But <laughs> uh, I think uh, pro- probably probably more, more they'd be run-oriented and play Bentley. But I think you want to get uh, both of them a lot of playing time and put them in in different situations and see what they do. Jeff Sims uh, was struggle busting it out there on Saturday. What is it about uh, these Nebraska quarterbacks? They're they're super injury prone. Adrian Martinez was that way when Colorado faced him yeah. uh, previously. Uh, that that was rough. Just as a fan of the game of football, uh, Jeff Sims even had a hard time, you know, figuring out the timing of those snaps. It was it was pretty yeah. ugly. Yeah, that that was nuts, and it was I've never seen a quarterback cause so many problems. Um, you know, going back to that real quick, I'm just looking at got the uh, the 
uh, depth chart up here, not the depth chart, but the eligibility chart. And going back before we walk away from that inside linebacker, you know, we still haven't seen a lot of Des Moines Kennedy. And one thing that I did like in, in at the end of the game was Jeremiah Brown got a lot of playing time. It really looked good. Granted, you know, it was in a mop, mop up time. So there's a lot of guys they can play and, and work with in that inside linebacker, Brandon Gant coming back this week. But yeah, going back to Sims, um, you know, it, it was, uh, it, it was, crazy how bad he was and, and and then you know had that one long play but uh did you know you mentioned when he got when he got injured on that one play that was Savelle Smalls I like seeing him out there in the flat running like that and, and making a big play so that that that's what stood out to me from that play aside from I don't know you know it's like what was that year we played Arizona and what was that kid that was ran for like 9,000 yards in one Khalil game? Tate Khalil yeah, Tate. yeah we, we we couldn't get him hurt and then and then Jeff Sims is our MVP in this game, and we knock him out. Well, ho- hopefully he's okay, but gosh, they they got to figure out the quarterback position there in Lincoln. That was that was rough. Yeah. Well, my wife saw him sitting on the on the sidelines all by himself, and there's nobody around him, and she's like, "I feel sad for him." And I was like, "It'd be all right. He's a corn husker. I don't have that in there." <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Leonard Payne uh, had had a nice game in there. He's been a a pleasant surprise in terms of, I think, early on during preseason, we weren't quite sure who else was going to really step up with Shane Cox and McClendon on that defensive line. And even J.J. Hawkins got quite a bit yeah. of run on there. So you're starting to see depth actually kind of improve. And now we're only two weeks into the season. Guys are going to get banged up. But at running back, Kavosia Smoke comes back in. We expect Alt McCaskill back in a couple of weeks there are some positions that are getting stronger here. Uh, we've talked cool. about linebackers coming back in the mix. Travis J potentially at some point. I don't know what the specific timetable is on him. The one area, though, is O-line. Uh, we, we'll get an update on Van Wells at Coach Prime's presser on Tuesday. It doesn't sound like it's all that serious, but we'll wait for official word there. That's the only spot that I'm r- really kind of nervous about in terms of uh, the injuries right now. Well, you're going back to that defensive front. Uh, Dave Harris has played a lot and, that, and, 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 you know, and then he showed up, I mean, you know, like you can play a lot and not show up and then you don't even get noticed, but he's been a surprise that he's played a lot. Um, you know, quite frankly, I'm a little, I'm a little disappointed in Coke so far. Um, and, and I think Payne had a bigger game than he did hit his little inside move where he got that sack was really pretty, really, you know, very, very athletic for a guy, his size. And so he brings that push and that physicality inside. And then I, um, I saw a lot of um, uh, Bishop Thomas and Amari McNeil out there too. So they're so so Sal's getting his big boys out there to get some playing time, and uh, you know I don't want to say that. I guess that de- that makes the defensive line bigger when those guys are out there. But our edge guys, Ty, Ty Alston and, and um, uh, uh, Jordan Dominic, really showed up in this game. Yeah. Really showed up and they were playing and I didn't I wasn't paying enough attention to see if they were always but on several plays they were the opposite bookends at end and um very different sort of styles where uh Taj brings a lot more physicality and, and size but uh Dominic is so quick um and they were both in the backfield on run plays and and pass plays and, and so that that really added an element I thought to uh the defense as well and I I, I just think that uh that Kelly really dialed up a great set of uh, adjustments and, and and coached a great game. It was a great performance by the defense. And uh, Carter Stoutmeyer, true freshman, uh, yeah. played a little bit more in this game as well. I keep getting asked on Twitter over and over again about Cormani McLean, and I'm at the point now where I'm just not responding. Right. It's it clear at this point he just needs to develop a little bit. People yeah. just are going to have to be patient with him. Well, Marion right. Cooper is it looks to be a pretty top level cornerback. Carter Stoutmeyer is a kid that came in with good pedigree. This was a guy that was committed to Arizona and had really yeah. impressive track times at his high school. Uh, his father played in the NFL, so he's grown up around the game. Uh, he didn't have the five stars by his name, but you know sometimes that's okay for the higher rated guy to come in and, and develop. And hopefully, Cormani McLean is patient because. He has shown enough that he's going to be a really good player. You know, he was going, they go ones V twos a lot during preseason. And so Cormani was having to go up against Weaver and Travis Hunter a lot in practice. And so 
he's going to get better. It just, it's got to slow down for yeah. him a little bit. And, and that's going to take a little time, but if you weren't good, at, if you didn't have solid options at cornerback, maybe that's more of an issue, but you're, right. you're okay there right now. Well, and I don't think, you know, I think it's more, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I I'm always sort of amused and people say, Oh, he's, 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 he's the highest rated guy. So he's obviously going to start right away as a freshman. Well, you know, we had the discussion back when we were doing the top 40 and I ranked him pretty low and, and said, look, he's a true freshman. We haven't seen this guy play. We, you know, great. He, he kicked backside against the high school opponents. Let's see what he does up here. And I think it, it's not, it, you know, it's one thing you go out and practice and you're doing one-on-one coverage of wide receivers. Great. You look great. But there's a lot more to playing cornerback in a game than just one-on-one coverage of receivers. And so, you know, our cornerbacks coach has to look at all those things and who who does all of them at a high enough level to get them in the game. And, you know, for whatever reason, he's not ready to play uh, um, McLean yet. And that that's not a knock on the kid. You know, it, there's still a big future left and, and a, a lot of season left. So we'll see. I think he'll show up out there. Uh, you know, if, if nothing else, the second half of the season, I think we expect him to come along after he's had some seasoning and practice and what have you. So Colorado, as you pointed out, had a great defensive game plan, executed a well got after the quarterback, got turnovers. On the other side, Shadour Sanders simply got hit too many times in this football game. Uh, He was sacked seven times, and I'm not putting this necessarily on the offensive line. I think there were times where Shadour was gambling too much. Uh, It's not that he's fragile. I think he's a guy that can, you know, take some hits, but I just don't think you can go week after week this season having him exposed that that much. And I don't know. How nervous were you watching that game? Or am I uh, overreacting to this? Well, I wasn't – I really wasn't nervous about it at all. I think uh, there, there was never any of those he, – he seems to take hits well. And, and what I mean by that, he's not standing back there in the pocket getting creamed. He's always on the move and, and you know, sort of seems sort of a glancing hit at best. But uh, the other thing is that, that um, you know – a lot of those sacks and pressures, well, mo- I would say most of them were not about the offensive line. It's very complicated when you talk about offense, and I think most fans tend to just say, oh, well, you know, pressure on a quarterback, offensive line sucks, but that's not the case because the pass protection from the five guys up front was actually pretty good. What Nebraska was doing was bringing five and six, and, and you know, and uh, so you have to, you either have to pick up a hot route or you have to get a running back to pick up that blitz coming through. And, you know, uh, one I like about this, they get better. Like Dylan Edwards just trucked the first time yeah. he tried to pick up that blitz a little bit later in the game. Somebody that, you know, had already take, obviously taken him aside or some had and, and talked to him. And, and the second time we, they ran a similar play and they ran that same blitz, he just totally took the guy out, submarined him, right? Which mm-hmm. is what you got to do when you're hit size. Um, so it, it's nice to me that they picked these things up, but that, that play, those two plays illustrate how other players got to pick things up too, because the whole design of that defensive play is to have the defensive lineman spread the lineman and then you got a middle linebacker come up late, right? So you can't expect an offensive line to pick that up. Um, so you have rules and you have uh, – everybody's got their assignments on that. The other thing I thought that that, that ended up there, – there was a lot of times that where that pressure came late and Shadur was standing back there. And I think that uh, Coach Prime hit it on the head when he said, you don't know – what all the responsibilities are. You don't know what he's looking at the receivers Did the receiver run the wrong route. And, um, you know, I think he, he, he has patience in his receivers. And there were several times, you know, when he threw over a guy that was coming right at him because that's what he had to wait for the guy to, to, to vacate that zone or that seam where the receiver would be, you know? So sometimes it's like, you got to bait that guy in uh, and get him to drop off your receiver or your running back. But um, so I got one of them up here right now and, 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 I just watching several di- several plays in a row, and, and quite frankly, the protection looks really good. There's a good pocket up there, um, and I haven't looked through and broken it down every single play of the game. But what they did was, you know, here I, it's still an effective offense, and they moved the ball. And I think the single f- biggest thing is we got to get that running game going because Nebraska, quite frankly, was selling out, um, sending you know five six guys. Uh, on the pass rush. Um, and one of the ways you can stop that is by running the ball effectively. So that's one way of doing it. I did vote for Jared Christian Lichtenhan as the Pac-12 Offensive Lineman of the Week. So we'll see if he gets that honor when they announce right. that. I think they yeah. do that, 
either late Monday or on Tuesday. Uh, do you are you as high on Tank's performance through two games as Pro Football Focus because they're pretty high on them? But I do take their grades with a, a somewhat of a grain of salt. Yeah, I don't think they have the personnel or the necessarily the experience to to. You know, it, it used to take me all day Sunday to uh, grade a full offensive line. You know, so if you're going to watch all five guys, you know, six guys, however many it was that would play this week, it, it takes a long time. And part of that is because they're they're all in that scrum, and you got to watch it. You know, you got to watch it for each guy. You got to watch it five, six, seven, eight times to see exactly what happens with them when they're all lost in the in the shuffle and what have you um i think tank's doing quite well i think his pass protection i think the grade reflected it his pass protection is certainly uh better than his run blocking right now but uh i think savion washington has has been the one that really sort of has impressed me in two games with his pass protection as well that they both you know use that amazing length and size to kind of wall guys off and move them up the field. So uh, I've been very impressed with both of them and uh, I haven't seen anything from either one of them that, that would make me question that grade that, that uh, tank got this week. Um, and, you know, I think that's good for him, whether they're, whether they're really watching that film or not and grading it, it gets out there that, that he's a top offensive tackle and people starting to come watch him. But uh what I see from both of them is very solid technique, and that's that's what matters. And I got to tell you that you know the guy that continues to impress me in there is Jack Bailey, who just is a, a superior inside pass protector, you know, against those really big guys, and he sort of stonewalled those dudes for the most part. When Van Wells went down late in the game, I thought it was interesting. They brought a true freshman, Hank Solinskis, into the game. Hank Solinskis, I'll try to – that's yeah. a tough one to say. In its center, um, and they kept Landon Beebe in at guard. Instead of putting Wilty in, were you surprised at all with, with that? And now I say that, Zolinskis' first play, he gets downfield and has an amazing block and yeah. looked pretty good from the the few clips he was – the few snaps he was out there. Well, I was watching him carefully because I was very excited to see him come out there. So, And he looked really good. You know, he looked really good against some big, powerful dudes. Um, and I'm not too surprised by it. I think center's a different ball game than, uh, than guard. And I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what they're doing in practice is, you know, whether BB's getting the most of the backup reps at center or if he's getting reps at, with the ones at guard. And so Zelenskis is running all those second team reps. But, you know, when you get a little bit of a, as an offensive line coach, when you're running two, two groups, you know, and, um, so you probably got two guys that are running most of the reps at center in practice. It's not too surprising to me that he just picked one as his number two when his other number two is a number one at another position. So I don't think it speaks – I don't think it says anything to Wilty at all. I just think that uh, it was a good situation to get a young player in there and see what he does. You know, I mean, I think the game was pretty well decided at that point. Uh, you know, so why not go with your actual backup and, and get the young kid in there and see what he does? So I, I don't think it's – a I don't, I don't make much of it. It didn't surprise me all that much. I've been watching Zelenskis in all the videos all summer long, and he looked really good. So I wasn't that surprised um, to see that happen at all. And, I, you know, it's always amazing to me. You go through an entire season, and the offensive line can change dramatically from game one you know, to game 12, whether it's because of injuries or who, who develops as a player or what have you. And I think anything I, – I think what one thing that uh, Bill O'Boyle was doing right there was he recognizes he got to build depth. The best way to build depth is put them out there and play. So I think that might have been part of it as well. I will say, though, uh, until there was 420 left in the first half and Colorado scored their first points, this was a, a rough football game. This was tough to watch. Uh, obviously, Colorado's offense was having a hard time getting going out the gates. And we already talked about Jeff Sims and just how awful that offense looked. Uh, I think this game will be remembered for you know the the post game celebration and the fact that uh, it brought college game day back. It was you right. know on a national stage, but people will probably forget how how rough this was to watch early on. Who wrote the? Who, who, so who was it? Sean Niehoff that wrote the initial. Uh, article in the game that the I think he used the word clumsy a yeah. clumsy game I thought that was right on the money man I was like that's yeah. a perfect word for that first half it was just a clumsy game like everybody looked like they were drunk 
Um, and we were, we were, and you know, on our side, it just felt like we were half a beat off, you know, like, like people weren't quite in sync, you know, like, like you just that much off. And, and, and if, if we just got it all dialed back in, you know, it's like, I, I said to the wife, it's, it's like, it's like somebody got time to plugs up or something on an old car, you know, and you just got to get it right. You know, cause it's missing. And all you got to do is get that timing just right. And all of a sudden it purrs again. Right. And that's what happened. And then yeah. I, I, I felt all along, I was like, Sean Lowe is going to get something going here, you know? And what I would add to that now after two games that uh, Sean Lewis got a huge ally on that field was Shadur because Shadur can get things going too. Cause I think he knows that offense very well. I think he's very comfortable with it. And I think they all trust those receivers um, to make things happen. And what I like is that, uh, you know, I wouldn't say Travis Hunter disappeared this game, but some other guy stepped up. Travaris Dawson sh- stepped up and, and uh, Xavier Weaver, you know, w- was electric. Um, and we just got, it's just kind of ridiculous. The weapons we got at wide receiver on this team. And the Cameron Stillman Craig pick too. Th- that felt like just yeah. one of those moments in the game when uh, maybe early on, both fan bases didn't feel good. And then, I think that was one of those moments where if you're a Colorado fan, you were like, okay, yeah, it's starting to come together and, you know, going on that 13, nothing run at the end of the first half and knowing that you're going to get the ball come out at halftime. Yeah. It's been a lot of guys stepping up. Even, you know, Jace Feely was three for three. Uh, Your favorite thing to talk about kickers, his kickoffs could still get a little bit better, but you know, got, I think most of them in the end zone. Right. And I think, you know, right, I, don't, I can't remember the exact timing of when things started happening, but right right around the time of that interception towards the end of the first half is when we started knocking Sims around and started putting him on the ground. And I, I you know, I think that I, that that poor kid, that guy was wrecked by halftime, you know, between all the pressure on him and knocking him on the ground and all those bad miscues and whatever. Um, I think he was pretty, pretty, pretty knocked out. But, uh, it, right around, right like as as Prime said, you know, right about with four minutes to go, we just started to dial it in and figure it out, both offensively and defensively. And that and that that interception was really kind of the end of the game, if you follow me. Not you know, like the beginning of the end. It's like like oh, okay, we're back. We're we're serious yeah. now. And I love the way I love the way he did it. He kind of he just you know. And I, you know, I'm not enough of a skill position guy to, to say whether this is more quarterback fault or whether whether Selma and Craig just baited him into it because it looked to me like he just played him a little bit and, and sort of, you know, dogged off just a little bit and 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 came in and just took that thing and and so I I, I really don't think that I really don't think Sim saw him. Otherwise, otherwise he's ta- other, otherwise he's he's got some money on the game to throw that pass because you know that was. So early in the fourth quarter, you're starting to look at the score and the number of possessions left. And if you're a smart football coach or mind, you go, okay, it's time to slow it down. What did Colorado do offensively? They started to slow it down. Now you would say that's obvious. Who who wouldn't slow it down? Well, we have some experience around here uh, for for those that are new Colorado fans. Uh, The Kansas game. Should should I say the word Iowa State? well, Oregon State in 2018, Oregon. right? Yeah. And, and right. Kansas yeah, in right. 2010, where yeah. almost it's like mathematically impossible to lose a football game. And they somehow right. did. So just kudos. I know, uh, you know, this coaching staff would probably say, well, this is pretty obvious. But uh, that that is something that's re- appear- that's sadly relatively new around here. Well, and and and. What's more impressive about it, frankly, is that we changed the we changed the pace and slowed it up and it still worked. And and the off, the running game started to get better, and we started biting off big chunks and kept kept moving the chains and and scoring points. So when they slowed it down, it kept working. It's not like they slowed it down and they started going three and out, you know, um, because some of the things they were, they started doing, they started focusing more on that run game. And this is what I'm gonna say this about the run game. I think when Sean Lewis wants to run the ball, we run the ball and we do okay with it. Um, when he when he decides this is what we're gonna do right now. You know, when it's when it's when it's more or less of a change of pace between several passing plays, maybe not so much. But I'm curious to see this week against what I consider an overmatched opponent if we just line up and and, and start to really work on that run game. Um, but I think when he focuses on calling the run plays, 
uh, we are much more successful at it. So I feel fairly good that, that we, will, we will get that going when we need it. One other thing that, that stood out to me a little bit through the two, first two weeks is uh, how well the receivers have blocked and how much effort they put into that. And I've always felt that it's one of those really small things that kind of t- takes an offense to another level. When you have guys that uh, really take it yeah. upon themselves to be active blockers and not just go through the motions. And again, that's another thing you would think is a just a foregone conclusion and obvious thing, but there have been Colorado teams where the receivers have not been willing to do that. Well, there are lots of teams where you see that and it really comes down to the mentality of the head coach and the receivers coach and what they expect. And, you know, there was one of the touchdowns uh, on Saturday where, where Travis Hunter had a key block right down by the goal line, you know, really, really, or maybe it was for a first down. I can't remember, but he was sort of towards the, Colorado sideline and he had a really key block to, to spring our guy for some extra yardage. And, you know, uh, here's a guy that's being talked about as a Heisman who didn't really, you know, he, 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 he had a good game, but he wasn't really the star of the show, but he was out there doing the dirty work and, and paying his dues, you know, and, and that made, that means a lot. So I think it means a lot to teammates when you've got a guy who's that famous and being mentioned as the Heisman guy, and you know, he's going to be out there, given everything he can to put a block on for you, you want to do the same for him. And I think it, 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 it plays over to uh, every other position. And one thing I've noticed is uh, th- this team plays hard. I mean, I, I have not yet seen anybody dogging on a play or going half speed. This, this team gets after it. And I think part of it is they know there's a guy on the sideline that could take their job. And they also know there's a guy on the sidelines they believe in and feel emotionally you know, bonded to that they want to, you know, it's like my, my best coaching was when my, when my kids love me and I love them and they, you know, you know, they tell me, I don't want to let you down coach. You know, when, when you're, when you're playing like that for a leader and we certainly got those kind of coaches now, they don't want to let these coaches down, you know, and, and that's the best way to do it. And so I, I really, this, this team plays with a lot of heart and passion. Now I was thinking this morning though, the, it gets harder as you go deeper into the season. You know, first game, TCU, super excitement, ranked team on the road, first game against Prime. Second game, Nebraska, big, huge rivalry, TV coming, blah, 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 right? Third game, eh, you know, you got the Rams. They're not good. To some extent, it's a rivalry, you know, in-state, um, you know. And so the, the, really the, the, the key of great coaching is to keep that – sort of uh, feeling going even against opponents that are not that special. Right. So there's a little hook this week with Colorado state being in state. And then we got Oregon and that, that should be self-motivating and, and those kind of things. But uh, I don't have, I, I just watching these coaches all summer long, they maintain that enthusiasm when there was no games coming and you would see those guys out there running and playing hard and practicing hard, even in the, in the hot summer. So um it's exciting yeah. to me to watch a team play like this. And if you're Coach Prime, don't you almost want national writers to continue to write really dumb things about your program? Because that's just that little extra thing. Because I really do think that this team likes kind of the us against the world mentality. And I yeah. think that was pretty that's been pretty evident early on this season. Yeah, although, you know, he was a very different guy in his post game this week. He, he was a very different guy. He, he didn't have that edge or that chippiness and, and was just very comfortable. And, and it, you know, it was, it was, it, he just looked happy and calm, you know, but I think you're we were, right. We were in the dry air of Boulder, Colorado, as opposed to that <laughs> muggy Fort Worth air. Maybe that affected his mood. That it. Yeah. It was just home and it got to, got to be calm and cool and collected. But uh, um, by the way, that I, press conference room was out of control. There were, it was just, Oh my like, God. It was like it wasn't even standing room only. It was like you're putting your head on somebody else's shoulder. It was so uh, packed in there. Tell us of what like are they from national places and whatever? Yeah, a lot it, of it, national it, places. And then uh, Coach Prime's got a lot of people that have kind of supported him throughout the years, and so a lot of those guys were given passes on the field and were kind of invited up. And no, it, it was fun. I'm not complaining. It just it's getting used to something that is completely yeah. different than what we're used to. Was it the is it the same space that they used last year and everything else? Just it is. more yep. more packed now. Yeah, which you know the, the the sports information people must be getting real tests nowadays. But uh, Curtis is know. doing a good job. It, I mean, this is 
his first year taking over from David Platy. I mean, he probably could have used one year with Carl Durrell just to, I, I think in any job, when you go through a, a year, you yeah. know all the responsibilities and you can anticipate as much as you want. And not that Curtis has done anything wrong, but it's just, it's tough. Like, you know, first yeah. year uh, to have all this attention on the program, but uh, no, and, and they hooked us up. So the guys that, you know, are around Colorado every day were given, front row seats at the press conference. So they've taken care of us. It's just, it's, it's a whirlwind around there now. And it's kind of uh, just a media spectacle in terms of all the people that are, are trying to get in that room. Right. And I can't even imagine, you know, the difference between this year and last year and trying to be around practice and the men and, and, and energy and the mentality and everything else. So it, you know, it, it's just everything, everything is just so exciting, the recruiting momentum and, you know, all, as excited as the recruits were, you know yeah. what they saw. I don't They've know. got guys. They got guys that are trying to commit that d- don't even have a, a committable offer right now. That's right. everybody's yeah. trying to get on board. Yeah. yeah, and I think you know one thing I would say two games into this season about recruiting is this: it's very clear that the that the skill position recruiting is top notch. We got to get the bigs, man. We got to get those talented bigs. I think, like you know, like you you look on the offensive line, and 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 I like these guys a lot, and they're scrappers, and and they're you know they're uh, really hard nosed players and such. But you know, I'd say uh, Tank and and maybe Savion and 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 Wells might be next level guys. But you look at a guy like David Connor who's not playing because of the chest injury. You know, that's a top level offensive line recruit. And we got to f- start filling the roster with those kinds of guys. We got to start filling those guys on the, you know, it's it's great to see the four and five star uh, skill position guys. We need to start seeing those guys on the lines too, because it's, 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 it's clear to me after two games that we need to get a more of an infusion of talent of the bigs in here. You mentioned Travis Hunter in the Heisman together earlier. Uh, if you had a Heisman vote through uh, two weeks, who, who's getting it between him and Shador? Cause we, Remember, we did a whole video talking about how it's 1A, 1B with these two right. guys and how it was right. so difficult with our top post countdown to decide who we were going to have number one. And now, after two games, these guys are actual legit Heisman candidates. Well, I, I think it, I think it's uh, we'll look at it like a like a horse race, like a match race between uh, Sea Biscuit and, and War Admiral Red, and then coming around the first turn, Shadur is kind of pulling away a little bit. Okay. He, he's had two really big games, and and I wouldn't I wouldn't say I'm gonna get I, I don't want to get hated on him for anything, but uh, you know Travis was kind of not that visible in this last game. He was super important, and and you know I, I think I think part of the problem he's gonna have is that everybody's not an idiot, and they ain't gonna throw at him, you know. Um, and then uh, the some of the other receivers stepped up, and so he didn't get as many touches on that side. But but but. Uh, in terms of being seen and visible in his role, I think Shadur had a much bigger game this week and really controlled that offense. I mean, his control of that offense and the way he moves that offense is just masterful. It, it's just, it, it, it's, it's, it, I, 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 you know, I can't come up with the superlatives that are big enough. It's like, like, you know, like a maestro, you know, like, like Mozart orchestrating, making everything happen just the way it's supposed to. And, and, um, you know, I'm not going to say flawless, but man, you know, it's, as, it's as pretty to watch as any quarter. Maybe, maybe I'm just starved for quarterback play in a CU Jersey and, and I'm, and I'm spoiled to see it now, but, uh, I, I would be hard pressed to imagine anybody else that's as, as effective in their offense as Shadur has been for two weeks. Yeah. And it is two weeks. So, uh, it will play itself out. I, right. I think naturally you would just guess okay it would be the quarterback but what Travis is doing is pretty much unheard of in college football if he continues the snap count up it is going to be an interesting debate and I picture Travis Hunter making a couple plays maybe even a handful or a dozen of just yeah top 10 number one countdown type plays that are sometimes uh, that that can kind of fuel a Heisman campaign. If you make some plays that just seem impossible, the Reggie Bush against Fresno state where it just, it's on a loop all the time, you know, throughout the season. Yeah. And I think, you know, so, you know, Shadur is going to be the week after week, 400 yards, 500 yards. And every now and then a really specific, you know, you know, 
a really special pass or whatever, but it's going to be the consistency of his greatness that's going to propel him. But you're going to see this season like that, that interception against TCU. And what I, I, I watched that again. And, you know, it, the, the announcer is like, Whoa, 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 you know, and, 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 you know, it's not scripted. It's just like, that's your human reaction to that play. And you're going to see him do things like that. And he's going to do them in against teams like USC and against teams like Oregon. And it's going to be national. Right. And everybody's going to see it and they're going to be like, holy cow, look at what Travis Hunter did this week. And then they're going to be like, well, let's watch next week and see what he does next week to beat it. Um, so this today, this week was kind of a quiet one. Um, you know, I don't know what that CSU brings it up to the table to, for him to really do much. But uh, uh, his, his level of excitement is that, that he's one of those guys that every single play could be that play. Yeah, he needs if he makes one of those plays against Caleb Williams. That's when it's yeah. really going right. to take off to another level in terms of the Heisman right. hype. Right, covering one of those receivers and, and and you know takes one of those uh, interceptions. What and and you know the first time he gets a pick six, which I I, I you know I bet you money he'll get one this year. But uh, um, that would be a big thing as well. You know, how concerned? Game. Yeah, sorry to cut you up. How how concerned are you about the ground game at this point? I'm really not. I'm really not. They haven't emphasized it, and when they have, they've been effective. You know, they, they've they've got a lot of things that they do on the ground that, that work really well, that that little um, it should, you know, that should your keeper for a touchdown was really pretty. And then uh, that little option um, with uh, 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 Dylan Edwards and, and I'm getting old. I don't remember if that was last week or this, this week, that little option touchdown to, to um, Dylan Edwards. That was week one. Yeah. That's a pretty little play. And then they're, they're doing some really interesting things with lead blockers and whatever. I don't know if you noticed that on the goal line, they put uh, uh Bishop and. Um, Shane Cooks, well, wasn't it? Yeah. Was, was it, it Shane Cooks? Yeah. Uh, on, on the offensive line and said, just go knock people out of the way. Um, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I don't know what that means. The lack of, uh, 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 uh that they that they don't trust those big guys up front on a goal line, but Coach, you know Coach Prime's yeah, Coach Prime was actually asked about that post game, and he said those guys block it better than our offensive guys do. So it was a pretty <laughs> yeah, I don't know what, straight I, to I the point answer. Yeah, I don't know what that means, you know, in terms of what they've done in practice and everything else. But uh, you know, when I go back to that touchdown where Bishop was the lead blocker at TCU, and what's lost in that play is you you, you see Bishop blow that guy up and ask what you think about. It. But if you go back and watch that play, the offensive line play was gorgeous. I mean, they just they just bought, washed the whole line down so that the only one left was that linebacker for Bishop to take care of. And and so I think those guys get a little bit of a raw deal. Um, because I think they're doing a really good job up there and we haven't really emphasized the run, but when we did on Saturday and, and frankly, when we got, uh, um, when, when we went back to Hank and the, and at running back, um, Hankerson, he was more effective between the tackles and Dylan's not really built for that. But, uh, when we wanted to, we were ripping off some pretty good chunks there. So I think that running game will work fine. You know, when we decide to emphasize it and, 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 I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at my screen and there's Adam Monster Tiger. Just showed up on my I got my computer screen with stuff running in the background. What, what's there what's popping there. up there? I don't know what this is. Uh, it's, talk, it's talking about Travis Hunter and uh, uh, I don't want to derail the whole podcast here. Okay. But no, there was some 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 pretty girl talking and you can't escape I, me. I brought you even, up. even if you try, <laughs> right? <laughs> So what's it to, to talk about that for a second, not to de- get off of football, but you're, you be, are, do you feel like you've become a little bit of a celebrity and people want your input and opinion because you've been around for a while and you're the old, old OG? No, it's been a lot of fun because I've done the alternative. I've been in those post game press conferences on the road where it's just Brian and I, and it's depressing. And as much as, yeah, you're not cheering in the press box. You're staying unbiased. I've never tried to hide the fact that, you know, I want to see these people that I'm covering succeed. And so uh, those road trips were really tough. And so I will gladly take these press conferences where uh, there's not enough room for all the people that want to be in there uh, and being, being able to cover a program that is this fun to cover, that is fun to watch. You know, I think, 
for me, at least the reason I got into this is that I love sports. And so you still want the product that you're covering to look good. And it just hasn't for much of this time, the last 20 years covering Colorado. So that's been. Go ahead. Sorry. But I think I'm going to have to start saying no to some radio interviews and TV stuff because it's kind of wearing on me a little bit, to be honest with you. That's what I was just going to ask because this, this thing that popped up on my screen behind in front of me here was you being interviewed uh, by some national person probably. And, and I was wondering, do you, are you getting a lot of calls to do those sort of, sort of interviews and such? And it was, it was video. So, you know, you were in front of Folsom field and then they had the other Nebraska guy on the other side. And um, are you getting those calls from various outlets and such? Yeah. And like, so we've got CBS sports network that's attached to 24 seven sports. And so I'm going to try to make all those interviews work because, you know, that's part of our company. So try to take care of them. Yeah. It's the other national stuff to where if I'm just, if there's, there's only so many hours in the day, if I just feel like it's going to wear on me too much, uh, then I'm going to probably start turning down some of those, but yeah, I think I'm doing out kick later today and I don't even know what I'm walking into there. It's, (laughs) there's a lot of these shows that are really popular that, um, I just had never really had much of a relationship with before, but yeah, now they, they want to talk Colorado football and, and most of the time I'm glad to do it, but right. uh, man, it, it's been a crazy, what is this now? Nine, 10 months. Yeah. You really even go back to, it started early October with Carl Durrell getting fired in the bye week And then it was almost like there were three seasons in one because you had Carl Durrell getting fired. Mike Sanford taking over and and then Coach Prime coming in. And it was just nonstop. And so it would be nice to have a day off every once in a while. But I know you work all the time too. And and so you uh and and there's a lot worse things to be doing than than covering Colorado football. So I, I'm grateful to be in this position. Um I wish I could get a little bit more sleep. Yeah, it's more fun when it, when it's going well, but you know, you were mentioning the the changes last season and it's almost inconceivable to me that that feels like it's another lifetime yeah uh and a different uh, you know the the uh, I'm, I'm struggling for words i just want to say ugliness and despair of the second half of that season you know and 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 you just knew there was nothing going anywhere and 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 then to contrast that with where we are now and and I don't know if you, I, I'm not sure where you want to go next, but with this, but it, it pops into my head. It's like, where do you see this going, man? Not, you know, not in a longer sense, but this year, I mean, I don't see an end to it. Yeah. And there's going to be obviously all kinds of rumors now that are going to come up with coach prime and where he's going to coach next. And I mean, I'm not going to tell anybody how to live their life, but if I'm a Colorado fan, I'm going to ignore that stuff. And just enjoy the present and what's happening right. there. And I would be shocked if coach prime's not here next year. Uh, I yeah. really would based on everything that I've heard. Um, can't predict the future. Nobody saw what Mel Tucker was going to pull, which is gosh, that could pull us and do a whole different discussion right uh-huh. now. Huh? Going down uh, that old boy. Uh, but just soak it all in right now. If you're a Colorado right. fan, right. But it, right. I, I think every game they keep winning, it's going to get kind of annoying what yeah. uh, the perception is going to be of like, why would he stay at Colorado? Well, if you say that, then you haven't spent a whole lot of time around Boulder and, uh, right. and, and you're seeing all these famous people, pro football right. hall of famers come to Boulder and going, Holy moly, this is an unbelievable setup here. You know, it's, well, yeah. it's kind of taken a lot of those people uh, by surprise. And I, and I would, I would turn it around and say back to those people is like, why would you leave here now that you've got this thing? It's like somebody mentioned, you know, uh, if Saban was to retire, you go to Alabama, you're just, you're, you're, you'll you'd be the number three guy, you know, you got bear, you got Saban, you're not building anything. You're just kind of keeping alive what was already there. I think prime laws to be the architect, you know, and, and to build this thing from the ground up and, you know, I, I just sort of feel like maybe 10 years in and he's got some national championships and it's his freaking thing. What, what's he going to gain somewhere else? You don't need money. You know, what he likes is the spotlight and, and to be able to do things his way and the prestige and whatever. And, and he, there is nothing that he can't get in Boulder that he can get somewhere else. As far as I'm concerned. 
he hasn't got a good Colorado weather year yet. His yeah. first year was kind of rough. It seemed like every season was a little bit more extreme than what we're yeah. used to. Yeah. But I think, you know, you know, he, I don't know. I, 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 sometimes I see the photos, like somebody, somebody took a photo of, you know, looking over the, the South end of the stadium out to the flat irons and, and they posted it to show the lack of red, but I was looking at that picture. I was thinking, my God, I get to watch football games here, man. And, and, and I don't ever stop and look out that way, you know, cause I'm always looking down at the field and I was like, my God, this, this place is beautiful. You know, and it's got to be, it's got to be kind of mind blowing, you know, like, like, like these guys like uh, Michael Irvin and such show up in Boulder and like, wow, I didn't know this was here. Yeah. And, you know, and I think, go ahead. Fox big new kickoff is coming back. Uh, this is the third straight game that yeah. it's going to be basically, I mean, it's pretty much centered around coach prime. You know, they talked about TCU, but the reason okay. that they were there is because of coach prime. So three weeks in a row, with them and college game day coming to Boulder for the first time since 1996 Rocky mountain showdown. I haven't heard the, the, the hatred towards them that I've heard out of your mouth towards Nebraska. You're one of those oh. guys that doesn't really accept CSU as a, as a true rival. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I, I, I was led to believe I was, I understood from the mountain West conference that those, that, that, that the big noon and, and the game day were coming for a mountain West game. So that's something. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I've never really felt like heat towards CSU. And I guess that's because the first year I was up here was when we restarted the the rivalry with them after a long time. And we beat them like a drum, even though we weren't very good. Um, you know, and if you look at it, you know, I guess what annoys me more, quite frankly, is every year that people talk about, oh, my God, CSU, got to be worried because they always play us close and they never play us close. You know, I mean, for uh, as a general rule, it's a it's a two or three touchdown win for Buffs almost every year, and and there's nothing about them this year that's special. So I don't know. It's hard to be real. It sort of feels like a little bit of a letdown, frankly. To, to, is oh, that the gotta, scary? Is that the scary part though? That would be the the letdown potential, just because, uh, or or does having College Game Day and uh, you know a eight p.m. crowd at Folsom that's going to be kind of nuts in there electric. Hopefully people are somewhat responsible because I, 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 it was before the TCU game in the opener last year, there was people getting carried out of there before it even kicked off. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, I think this coaching staff is not going to let that happen. Um, they're just not built that way and they're far too experienced to let that happen. Um, and I think if they're, you know, you know, I worry more about a letdown against like a Washington state or somebody like that, who's actually got talent. Than against CSU, you know, who has, I'm just going to say it, they don't have any talent anywhere. So um, even if we, even if we didn't show, if we didn't, if we came out flat, we'd still push them around and get, have our way with them. So I don't know. It's just, it's just not hard. It's just not easy for me to find too much excitement to look at CSU and take them seriously because even in our worst years where we beat them handily. And now, you know, I, I, I just expect this to be a boat race and, and, you know, like a tune-up game, but I, I don't, I don't think this staff will allow this team uh, to come out and be complacent. <laughs> you just, you a hundred percent just sounded like a big brother right there. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you summoned the big brother persona that CU fans uh, feel they have over CSU. I love it. That's good for the yeah. podcast. Well, you know, I, I work with a, I work with a guy, you know, who, who's a CSU grad and he's talking about, you know, I, I don't know how this relates to this conversation, but he was saying, you know, I don't go up there because it's so hard to get in the dang game with the traffic and everything and where the stadium is now, and whatever. And they're no good. There's not, there's no point. It costs $500 to take the kids and go watch the darn game. He said, if I'm going to spend that money, I'll go to see you and watch a good team play. You know, and I was like, I don't really have anything to say back to you, you know, except I was like, they got that, they got that brand new stadium up there and they don't have really much to put in it. Yeah, but I think I like we, we travel up there uh, next year, right? I think the game is in Fort Collins. So I'm actually kind of looking forward to that. I just – I enjoy seeing new stadiums and new environments. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. I just don't think this is a rivalry that does much or does anything for us. And it's not – and I don't know. You know, it's like Nebraska used to look at us until we started beating them. It's not really a rivalry until they start to actually compete with us. But um, I don't know. that that there. I, I just don't see – much to be excited about playing them. 
Well, props to Rick George for getting that game out of Denver first off. Yes. It was getting so stale down there. Um, and there was, I think everybody was kind of clinging on to the lightning game with Joel Clad, but, and there were yeah. fun games back Bradley Van Pelt and, and when both teams were ranked, but it had just right. gotten uh, to be such a drab atmosphere down in Denver. And I, I think if you pulled Colorado fans, which I think Rick George was doing, I think that's a big part of why he pulled out of those games being played in Denver. It, it seemed like it was like 85% people didn't like the game down there and the 15% right. that did did because they lived close by, it seemed like. Yeah, we've got this beautiful atmosphere I was just talking about up at, up at Folsom, and to not use it seems criminal, you know? Yeah. And we're not going to pack that – we're not going to pack that NFL stadium for this game, you know, maybe maybe in some future. This year, I think it would have happened. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. I mean, they're not much of a draw, but uh, uh, you think – you think what's that stadium hold on there, 75, something like that? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, maybe. Who knows? I don't know. I'm glad we're not finding out. <laughs> well, William, that was another fun post game recap podcast well, here. Well, let did, me. Ask, did you have something else? Okay. Yeah, let me ask you real quick. I I, I was just thinking to myself, uh, if you have uh, any surprise players, positive or negative, that stand out to you after two games so far, offense, defense, whatever. Carvaris Dawson coming in there, I hadn't written him off because when you have yeah. that type of speed, uh, you find some role for them, even if that's just special teams. But him getting in the end zone twice in one game, uh, second game of the season, I, I wouldn't say it was a, a shocker, but it was you know a slight surprise in terms of him having a big impact. Hopefully, Giovanni Antonio can get back out there healthy because he was one of the guys I was right. most excited about. So uh, it was good to see that. I mean – a couple of glimpses of Mikey Harrison have been fun out there where he's gotten yeah. through a, a, you know, a tackle. Um, he was, but, he was one of the ones I was going to say, but more than anything, what's great is that all spring ball, all preseason camp, us at, as media are reporting on things that are said by coaches and players. And you're kind of putting your stamp of approval on some of this stuff when you're reporting it. And it stinks when the team you cover goes out there and does what Colorado does last year. And, right, right. and yeah, there's a Jordan Tyson that breaks out. But generally, most of the things that the right. coaches and players were saying throughout the, all those months didn't turn out to be true in terms of guys that were ready to be big time players. And so <clears throat> that's what's fun is right. we've heard all this stuff about Shadour and Dylan Edwards and Travis and man right. they're living up to it in fact they could even get better all of those guys you know right. so that that's the exciting part is that you feel like when you have coaches tell you certain things and you report on it that when you go to cover that football game on saturday you're going to see that happen and so uh, it, it lends to your credibility a little bit as a reporter which is nice yeah and i, I was you know I, I sort of along those lines the surprising things to me is like you know, like when I look at the offensive line, you know, I, I had expectations for Wells and for Tank, you know, um, and then Tyler Brown goes out and it's like, mm, I got a little concern now at that guard position. So, you know, the three guys that that uh, really stand out to me, Michael Harrison's one of them. We had such concerns about that tight end position. And in both games so far, he's made really big plays that were critical, you know, at the time that he made them. And then, you know, the two guys that, that have really kind of impressed me on the offensive line, it, I well, Jack Bailey is a big surprise to me. I mean, I I really didn't expect him to be as good as he is. But then, you know, Bill Boyle told us, he said, this is a tough guy, and, and he goes out there and battles every single time. So I guess I shouldn't be surprised because he warned us. But then I'm very pleasantly surprised with Savion Washington at that right tackle. He's so good in his pass protection, you know, and people were concerned that would he be quick enough coming from that lower level, and he's just done such a good job so far. So those are the ones that kind of stand out to me, and it's, it's sort of the same thing you said um, there's guys we expect it from, and then there's other guys sort of stepping up. And what sort of is fun about this team is each week, you know, you can see, look for a different guy at, at various positions to step up and be the guy. Cause they're, you know, part of it is because they're all brand new to us. Um, and everybody's fighting to, to get some playing time. But the other part is that, 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 you know, we may not go to that 85 deep in the roster, but all those guys are players for the most part. So I think it's exciting. 
One other guy, too, uh, as I was thinking about it, Marvin Hamm on defense. I'll be honest, the first yes. time Andre Hart mentioned that he had emerged as a starting guy there, I did pause, and I, there was a little concern. And I thought, well, okay, you know, Marvin Hamm's been here for a while. He's uh, taken some lumps, uh, and Andre Hart says that uh, a move into to a different linebacker position has really fit his eye a lot better. Right. Uh, but I needed to see it out there to believe it. And it's not that he's played perfect football, but he's played pretty solid for through two weeks, especially the, this past Saturday, I thought. Yeah, he showed improvement from game one to game two. So that's what that's all you can ask for is like keep watch guys keep getting better. All right. Well, this was fun. I will let you get uh, to your day job, William, but uh, appreciate you as always. Thanks, man. I, I, I love doing it. And, uh, it, it. It's a really a lot of fun and hopefully we keep on winning and keeps being a, uh, an exercise and joy and happiness. <laughs> Definitely. Well, hopefully uh, another positive recap show we'll have for you next week. William, thanks again. And thanks to everybody out there for tuning in.